Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm so excited for this next session. There is perhaps nothing more important than food systems for our future on this planet, for the creatures with whom we share this planet, and for ourselves. We've seen from the pandemic the disruption of our globalized food systems, and the good news is we have the pioneers, the innovators, the strategists, the practitioners who are making our future food and agricultural systems happen now. We know they work. We know they're better. Uh, for those of you who haven't been with us, I'm Amy Christensen. I founded the Sun Valley Forum in 2015 to help connect these global innovators to accelerate what they're doing and to bring them here right to Sun Valley, Idaho, where we're working to pioneer our own own new food and agricultural system, our own building of a resilient community. I'm very proud to say the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience food team were semi-finalists in the Rockefeller Foundation's global competition on food systems. So our food system vision um, uh, top one in the world. And so um, you'll be hearing more about that during our breakout session at 2 o'clock on food and agriculture. So be sure to join us for that after this, these sessions. First, um, wanted to remember uh, the scanning our impact hub. Plus Media worked with us to create an impact hub. When you get inspired about food and agriculture, you hear the speakers, you can go on there and immediately know about their organization, take action, sign up, be involved um, in the moment that you're moved. So please be sure to scan the impact hub. Um, I'm also, I'm so pleased to introduce Mark Brand. Mark Brand is a renowned chef based in Vancouver, really between Vancouver and New York. He is a food and equity pioneer. He is bringing cost-effective, locally sourced, healthy meals to those at risk, in need, the homeless, women, BIPOC, BIPOC communities from Vancouver to Italy. He is innovating and building the better future for food that we need. Please join me in welcoming Mark Brand. We love Amy so much, don't we? We love Amy. Amy's our favorite. Um, everybody who's supposed to be here is here. That part I know for sure. Everybody who's supposed to be here is here. This is uh, an important point I'm gonna start with, which is cooking and food literacy are the two or one most important skill a human can possess. Why? 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 Without it, we all die. Air, water, food. Who knows how to cook in the audience? My people are in here today. All right. This is why. All of it's interconnected. All of it's the same. Without it, we can't do this. Yet, the systems are completely broken, and we don't have access to it. And we see how fragile it is. This is an important point. All my real cooks in the audience know that. They know that's true. This part is really interesting because we consistently are pushed towards the solutions of creating more things. It's more stuff. It's more cars, but electric. It's more power plants, but nuclear. It's more food, but this way. This is this. Do we need more food? We produce enough to feed the planet 10 times over, if not more, already. This is also true today, this morning, tomorrow, every day. This is also true. Isn't that crazy? It's a lot of countries in the world. If food waste itself was a country, 10% of emissions that we're fighting is created by food waste. And people are starving, and we have that much of it, and it takes a lot to produce it. This is also true. We're going to hear a lot of technical solutions. We're going to hear a lot of science. All of it's incredibly important. Don't let me downplay it. But this is also really simple. It's not difficult. I've been in this my whole life, and I've traveled the whole globe. And this is true. This is also still true. So what do we do? Create more and just ignore the waste? Robert Swan won't have a place to walk on if we do that. We don't want that. And also, nobody wants to eat waste. 
at all. But everybody loves leftovers. I love leftovers. I want to eat that. So what are we doing about it, more importantly? Well, we tell the truth, first and foremost. The single most important thing we can do right now is tell the truth. I got to speak at the UN General Assembly. I get to speak at rooms like the G20. I work with the Future Food Institute, the United Nations, the FAO, all these fancy folks and fancy titles, and I go and I tell the truth. I was reminded the G20 by a couple of ministers after I spoke that it's a business conference. Quite smugly, actually. And I was like, well, you're going to be in the business of drowning. Didn't make many friends. Don't really care to at that point. Truth is important. So we also like to influence the imagination. I think it's incredibly important. Storytelling is one of the most powerful tools that we have, period. Be good at your job. Tell the truth and tell stories that matter. Right now, we need that. We need to understand how to do things simply, to do them ourselves. Our dear friend Vic Parrott says, our community directly next to us. That's been the center of my design my whole life. I got invited to do a dinner after the G20 for about 100 UN delegates. And I said, are there any parameters for this dinner? And they said, it, it should be around something to do with food and poverty. I was like, any other parameters? They said, no, it's great. What's the budget? They said, almost nothing. Always. So I took a maker space in Bushwick, Brooklyn, that had a sink and an induction burner. And I called a company called Bad Apple. Bad Apple sells ugly fruit and ugly food. And I said, can you bring me your garbage? And they said, do you know what we do? I was like, yeah. They're like, our food already kind of looks like garbage. I was like, yeah, bring me the stuff you can't give people. So they brought me cases of rotten pineapple, rotten watermelon. They brought me old corn, and we turned it into food. I didn't tell anybody. Just made it. This is me plating waffles that we dehydrated husks of corn and the corn meat that we could save into. And then we took the savable parts of the watermelon and some cauliflower and roasted it off and made kind of a chicken and waffles. Um, it was delicious. We fed all those folks that at the end, I was like, how did you enjoy your meal? That and many other dishes. And they're like, it was so inventive. It was so interesting. It tasted so, they had all these flowery words for it. I was like, cool, it was garbage. <laughs> some delegates were on board, some not so much. Influence the imagination. Chefs can do this. Cooks can do this. Kids can do this. We know how. We stop teaching. We also feed people every day. Uh, I own a business, a nonprofit, a B Corp, charities and corporations, LLCs, all just tools. Tools to work with everybody and anybody that I can. And one of those businesses is a 1957 butcher shop on Hastings Street, the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, Snohomish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, in one of the most marginalized communities in the world, and one of the most beautiful cities in the world. If anybody watched the Olympics, real pretty. Our mayor bust all the homeless people out, literally because the truth is only important sometimes. In that community, I've worked for 16 years. I've opened 12 businesses, most of them restaurants. In about 10, 11 years now, I pivoted to doing impact work only. Because once I started doing it, I was like, what am I doing with all this cool guy shit, to be frank? It's not helpful. It doesn't make me feel good. You don't actually make much money in restaurants, so don't ever open one. And we started feeding people. We started feeding 80 people a day in a meal program with a supportive organization called the Tiro Women's Resource Society, who I adore, that help women and children fleeing violence. The first meal I ever sent out was a chickpea and kale salad. There was almost a riot. Dietary sensitivities are important. People who are struggling sometimes have issues with medications, with teeth, and also with preference. Nobody wanted a chickpea and kale salad. So I sent pizza and I was okay. The next day we started to really work on what mattered. And we designed a 21 day rotational menu that is indigenous ingredients, is culturally sensitive. It runs through all the different pieces. Our chefs and I get to work on it with waste food, waste quote unquote, quote unquote waste, with suppliers we care about. And to this point we do about 2,000 meals a day and have done over 4 million out of a program that started with 80 a day. Feeding people is incredibly important. More important than feeding people is teaching them. Feeding people's a Band-Aid, for sure. 
I have no visions of grandeur that what we do with our meal program is a solution. It's a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. During the pandemic, I got locked in. I'm uh, immune compromised on three different levels. I got locked into my apartment. As you can probably tell, I, I don't do well alone. So I was trying to figure stuff out, and I was on these meetings every day with people. What are we going to do? How can I help out? And I was getting my groceries delivered. But at the time, I was running a program called Sharpen Up in Brooklyn, specifically in Brownsville. Brownsville is the most affected zip code on the continent. And I was working in community centers, teaching people how to cook, predominantly women and children fleeing violence. Again, blowing breakers, having fun, doing the thing. I thought about them immediately and thought, what's it like right now to be living in a single room with a family? What's it like to not have the things that you need? So I created this program called Sharpen Up where we delivered groceries based on allergens, likes, dislikes, cultural sensitivity, the same way I was getting my groceries. And then we paired up chefs. That's Eris Johnson. She won Master Chef in the States. Imagine her showing up on your Zoom call as a kid. Pretty great. And we did a three-parter. The first part was get everybody together, ask all the questions about food to chefs. The second part was a one-on-one -on -one class. You picked the menu item and Eris taught you, or I taught you, or Chef Dave Cornell, or lots of other people. And we hung out with you and your family. And we watched fa families galvanize, but we also watched mothers and fathers see the brilliance of their children. Because does this kid look shook? He's got a whole Branzino there in green beans. <laughs> I meet adults that tell me they burn salad. This kid was like, what's next? This is what we have to foster. He doesn't want McDonald's anymore. Pretty much ever. Look at these two rascals. This is what that looked like. I'd partnered with a corporate entity who will go nameless that said they would continue to support us in a 20 year deal to do 40 of these cohorts of 25 families. Um, I got an email in October that said their KPIs had changed. That's theirs to live with, not me. We showed up for all 40 of those cohorts and fed people and figured it out together. We also used the waste. Again, this, not that. This, not that. This is a urban agricultural organization called Soul Food that helps women, men coming out of recidivism, coming out of street entrenchment, find their purpose in the dirt. We take over dead plots of land and we plot. They're called Soul Food. We take all of their waste that doesn't go into pricey CSA boxes. And this is what our meals look like. This is a corn and a hominy chowder with some waste bread, which is a very traditional sailor's dish as well. We don't put soup out, per se. We put out real meals. And when we know about cooking, this is what this looks like. When I was seven, I was in Edmonton with my grandmother, who had about, I don't know, an eighth of an acre that she grew all of her preserves and stuff on. And she taught me how to do all of this stuff. We teach everybody how to do this stuff. There shouldn't be any garbage when you go grocery shopping. It turns into all of this. So we created this waste program with two people, the electric tricycle that we already deliver our meals on, and three grocery stores because we ran out of money and we needed to put out more meals. And this is the math as of this morning. It's what two people do in the garbage from a grocery store. It's simple. We just take it, we look at it, it's ingredients, and we make beautiful food. And we feed people. It's no more complicated than that. I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts. This is critically important. And we know the difference because we feel it here. If that's shaky and telling you it's shaky, it is. Or dig deeper. We get nervous too. But work with people who really genuinely care. Take your time. I guess that's the last slide. <laughs> I've been coming to this forum for four years. Last year I got to cook with a whole bunch of kids and we went to the farm, we pulled carrots out of the ground and we made them together. And those kids still hit me on social media. It is electric to cook food with people to teach them where it comes from. The science is super interesting. The people who are about to present to you are doing things that I don't even understand. And I've been doing this since I was nine years old. I'm old now. 
I'm so impressed by it, and simultaneously, what I just shared with you has to be the designing center point of our food system, of climate justice, of social justice, of poverty reduction. Food is a human right, it's a birthright, and we've commodified it to a point that we discard people. It's not okay. Lots of love, thank you.